such a special way. And one of his verses in the book of Psalms says that it is good to give thanks to God. Amen. It is good to give thanks to our God. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. Let's give thanks. It is good to give thanks to our God. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. Let's give thanks to God. Hallelujah. For his goodness and his grace. Oh, glory. We thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. We give you the praise, oh God, for your Holy Spirit that you have your way in this place on today. We thank you, Lord God, for you are a great God and you're a good God. We thank you, Lord God, who is worthy of the praise. Hallelujah to your name, oh God. For there is no other name but the name of Jesus. Lord God, we thank you, Lord God, for the reigning of your blessing upon us, oh God. Oh, we magnify your name, oh God. We thank you, Lord God, for the increase, the expansion, open doors, Lord God, opportunities. Lord God, we thank you right now. We thank you, Lord God, for your word is true, that you never leave us nor forsake us. And we give you the praise. We honor you, Lord God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God, for your anointed in this house on this morning. Thank you, Lord God. In the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord God. Come on, just thank him right now. Just thank him for the Holy Ghost in this house. Thank you, Lord God. Let him stand up for his presence. Oh, we are grateful people. Father, we thank you right now. Glory to your name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. I'm so thankful.
back in Jesus' name. We have the victory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Come on, let's unite as a body this morning. Let's unite. That's power and unity. Unity in the body, unity in the spirit. Woo! As we praise him as one Lord. Hey. Say one Lord, yeah. One Lord. One faith. Oh, 
clap offering. Come on and clap your hands with me. Put your hands in this place. Clap your hands with me. What is the highest praise? Hallelujah. We lift you up, Lord. Hallelujah. We give you glory, Lord.
lift your hands and worship him. Lift your hands and worship him. Lift your hands and surrender to God right where you are. Just surrender to him. Say, God, I give it to you. Say, God, I give it to you. Whatever, whatever's been weighing you down throughout the week, give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus.
do you feel? The Lord is in this place. He's working miracles. The Lord is in this place. Don't miss him, touch the him. The Lord is in this place. Yes, he is, yes. The Lord is in this place. Miracle working power. The Lord is in this place. Hey, say the Lord. The Lord is in this place. Grab hold of the word. Grab hold of the word yeah. and don't let go. Grab hold of the word and don't let go. Grab hold of the word and don't let go. Grab hold of the word and don't let go. Grab hold of the word and don't let go. Grab hold of the word and don't let go. Grab hold of the word and don't let go. Faith. Grab hold of the word. Why he wanna attack your faith? And don't let go. Grab hold of faith. And don't let go. Come on, grab hold of faith. Don't let go. Grab hold of faith. It's the things of substance. Substance the things hope for, but it's not seen. Come on. Don't let go. Grab hold of faith. Don't let go. Grab hold of faith. Don't let go. One more time, grab hold of faith. good. Amen. We've got some announcements here for you. I want to start out by reminding you of corporate prayer. Uh, here at the church, we have corporate prayer every Friday night, 645 to 715 before our service. So please come out and join us for that. And then also Sunday morning at 830 a.m. Uh, to 845. We have corporate prayer as well. And I want to remind you, next Sunday, we're going to have our water baptismal service. Uh, the directions for all of you that have signed up for the water baptism, the directions are in the front lobby. Pick those up as you leave. That will be at Prophetess Lisa and Minister Charles' home there. So you've got the address there and your directions for you. And then also, we have got next coming up next Sunday, Apostle Andre Jones will be here ministering on Sunday morning. So he's, he's coming in to go to a China with Apostle, and so we thought we'd bring him in early so he could minister for us as well. It's going to be a great time. And then we have our men's meeting coming up. Um, that will be... Let me see. No, you just had your August meeting. The next one will be the 19th of September. August, excuse me, August. I'm sorry. And then the Women of Destiny, they have theirs the 16th. Okay, that's Saturday the 16th. Ladies, get signed up for that. And then you'll have directions, the address and directions to the Hilton Garden Inn as well. Okay, and we have our Vacation Bible School going on right now. So if you have children, please bring them in. They're having a great time, and uh, we don't want them to miss it. So that will continue through August the 13th. And remember, it's Sunday mornings and Friday nights. So bring your children on Friday nights as well to participate in that. And then we have the Gathering of the Remnant Conference. Okay, and just a reminder also for our young adults, you meet every Sunday immediately following the service upstairs uh, with Minister Desmond and Talisha, and uh, you don't want to miss that, okay? If you're between the ages of 18 to 32, you're welcome to go up and meet with them, and that's open to you, so take advantage of it. And this morning as we take up our tithes and offerings, I want to talk to you for just a minute. 
because we we're just talking about grabbing hold of faith. Okay? We have got to take a faith stand. Okay? The dictionary defines will as strong purpose, intention, or determination. Okay? And when you go to the Lord and you believe the Lord, you believe to receive, but you have to believe with a strong uh, purpose. You cannot waver until the answer comes. You've got to make an irrevocable decision to continue with your confession of faith no matter what. Okay, I've told you time and time again, this church has many, many examples of this. The Lord, I mean, first of all, the Lord took us from out in uh, Davie to the Lord said, I have need of you in downtown Fort Lauderdale. I said, Lord, I've never even been in downtown Fort Lauderdale. I don't, why are you calling us there? So we went down, we started, took a group, we started praying, we started looking for a building, we found a building, and then the Lord said, no, that's not the right one, it's the one across the street. <laughs> and we, it was a challenge. I mean, it was one challenge after the next. And I spent my time at City Hall, and every time I'd go in, they'd send me away with no occupational license. And so we fought the good fight. And my point is you cannot give up. And if you have the word of the Lord on something like we've had over the years for the house that we're living in right now, well, it didn't come easy. The Lord says it's yours. We drove in the driveway. He said live in it, dwell in it, and acquire property in it. So I go to the bank, and the bank said, refuse to give us a loan on the house. Not once, but twice. And we had to stand and believe God that his word was true. He had said that was our home, and sure enough, eventually, after the second um, turning us down, they decided to give us a loan on the house. It was the same with this church building. Okay, there was a family here that owned this building. They had a little grocery store in the back there, and it looked totally different than it does now, believe me now. But there was um, one of the gentlemen, Mr. Rosenthal. He was such a blessing, and he loved us, a sweet Jewish man. He loved us, and he was so happy to have the church here. We had this room only, okay? And... Uh, so he asked us after a while, he said, well, wouldn't you like to buy the building? And we said, you know, we prayed about it. We said, yes, we'd love to buy it. And it was great, but his, the other four family members that were involved in it all said, no, we don't want to sell it. Okay. So here's God saying, it's yours. Okay, so we had to continue to pray, and with Mr. Rosenthal's help, he convinced the rest of the family to sell it to the church. Okay, but my point is that you have got to stand in faith and not waver. And especially when you have the word of the Lord, you can count it. You can just determine in your heart that it's already done. It's already done, and God will make a way no matter what dem demonic forces try and stand in your way. You will get the breakthrough if you'll stand firm in the word of God. So we've got to stand firm. We've got to resist the devil. We've got to attend to the word of God, and we've got to speak faith only. Okay, when it comes to your finances, if you're working, you're doing all you know to do, you've got to believe God. You've got to speak faith over your life. You've got to believe God. Maybe the Lord will open a new door for you, a new job, whatever it may be. He'll, if you're faithful in your giving and your tithing, God is going to provide for your needs. Okay? And you may go through a dry period, and we've been through some of those ourselves. And I told you last week, digging through the couch for coins, okay? I mean, we were at that place. But God always provided. He always provided. Why? Because our faith was in him. 
and he'll do the same for each and every one of you this morning. So as you come, you bring your tithes and offerings, I want you to just think about what that is, what that need is, and I want you to declare it that it is coming to pass in Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord. We speak increase over each and every one here. We thank you for their faithfulness, Lord, and we thank you for increase in every area of their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise team. <laughs> greetings, greetings, greetings. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
I make sure this high tech Bible works. This one here has been pounded on. You know, when I was in Germany, you know, they had a big pulpit. You know, you could pound on it, you know. Like the Germans, they preach and they pound on the pulpit. Have you ever seen that before? Amen. You guys ready to pray with me? All right, well, shall we stand up or just sit down? Does it matter? I don't know if it matters or not. But well, I figure if I got to stand, you ought to got to stand. Amen. Well, Lord, we just come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray your kingdom come and your will be done today. Lord, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear what the Spirit of God would say to the churches. And we thank you today for that prophetic insight in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. 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 You may be seated. I'm going to spend a little time today talking about the latter rain movement that happened in 1948 in Canada. And um, how many of you believe that we are part of a supernatural call of God, all of us? So go with me first, though, to the book of Acts. You know, the Lord said this to me a long time ago. If you want what the apostles of old had, then you need to preach what the apostles of old preached. And so if you want a move of God, you've got to preach a move of God. If you want prophetic announcements and prophetic beginnings, then you have to preach about them. Amen. And so what we have to understand is when we come together, the power of our unified faith means something to God. If you recall, last week I was talking about the revelation that Jesus got from Peter because Peter said, Thou art the Christ. So not only did Peter have a revelation, but Jesus got one too. Because Jesus asked the people, he said, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And some said, you're this or that or the other. And then he asked them a question, well, who do you say that I am? So how you see Jesus is going to determine what Jesus is going to be able to do in your life. If you see him as a healer, you're getting healed. If you see him as a deliverer, you're getting delivered. If you see him as your prosperity, you're getting prosperity. If you see him as a revelator, you're getting revelation. Do you understand that? Now, in 1948, what happened was that people began to believe God for the supernatural power of the Spirit of God to move in their lives. Now, in Acts chapter 10, Peter, remember, Peter's got this problem. You know, Peter doesn't want to associate himself with a particular group of people. So he's got a problem inside, and God's going to deal with that problem with him. So he sends him over to this man Cornelius' house. And uh, I want you to see what happened. In verse 30, chapter 10, verse 34, Peter opened his mouth, and he said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. That is a powerful statement coming from a man that thought that he was. Can you see that? So he's got a revelation here. Peter's got another revelation that God is not separating his people into different divisions. Amen. God is not a racist. Amen. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. The word which God sent unto the children of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word, I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which the John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with what? With the Holy Ghost and with what? With power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. Now, the anointing that was on Jesus is the same anointing that we have today. It's not a different anointing. The same Holy Ghost that came upon Jesus is the same Holy Ghost that comes upon us. Do you believe that? Yes. Now, this wasn't preached after uh, a long time, for a long time. People weren't expecting the move of God. They weren't expecting the power of God. Now, if you back up for a minute and you look at the ministry of Jesus and you look at the New Testament, what you see is you see Jesus, the Son of Man, going to the River Jordan, being baptized by the Spirit, and you see him coming out, being sent into the, to the unseen spirit world to deal with Lucifer. Amen. He, comes, he uses the Word of God there. He says, the devil is written repeatedly over and over again. But he comes out of there, and he comes out of there with power. And this is what we have to understand. That same power that was on Jesus is on us. Now, in 1948, they began to preach that. They began to preach that the Holy Ghost was sent by Jesus, amen, to be the restoring king, 
to lead us and guide us in the truth that we needed for our generation. They started preaching that. And let me just read something to you from it, and then we'll jump over and we'll read the scripture where he talks about the, the former reign and the latter reign. But uh, the latter reign movement was an early 20th century Pentecostal revival movement that began in North America. It was marked by extravagant supernatural claims and a belief in the restoration of the fivefold ministry gifts. Its teachings were heavily influenced by the holiness movement of the late 19th century and the Pentecostal movement of the early 20th century. The movement began in 1948 in North Battleford, South Kawacha, Canada. And uh, it talks about who, this is an article in, the, in JonasClark.com. It's talking about the fivefold ministry and the teachings of the latter rain movement. You could read about it more there on the website. But um, they were teaching, these people were teaching that Jesus has sent the Holy Ghost to empower the people. Somebody say to empower the people. Empower. Now, this is amazing. Now, you know, if you think about it, if Jesus needed the Holy Ghost to do what he was called to do, don't you think, I mean, with a little bit of, a little bit of elementary logic that uh, we need the Holy Ghost as well? Amen. Amen. Because you can't do it. Jesus said you can't do anything without me. Amen. Amen. So now Jesus didn't leave us with that, without help. He sent us the Holy Ghost, amen? And the Holy Ghost came on the people in the early church, and they began to prophesy. They began to walk in signs and wonders and miracles, and the, the anointing was on the people, amen? Now, that was also a miracle because they had not seen that before because the only wor working that they had done is when Jesus was around. But when Jesus was taken into the heavens, into the commanding heights, sent the Holy Ghost and now empowered the people, launched the church into ministry, just like Jesus got launched into ministry. Yeah? Now, let's go look at this now. You know that I mentioned this Friday night in John 16 because we have the power of the Word of God, we have the power of the Holy Ghost, and uh, we have the authorization to use the name of Jesus. Somebody say that's a powerful you know, the name of Jesus is the master key that unlocks the kingdom of God. So the question would be today, do you still have your keys? You still got them, amen? How many people would say, I still got the keys and the keys to unlock the mysteries of the kingdom of God? Now, in John 16, verse 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak. And he will show you things to come. So now Jesus is talking about what's going to happen when the Holy Ghost shows up. Amen. Amen. He shall what? Glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. And all things that the Father has put are, are mine. Therefore I said that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. In other words, he's going to reveal unto you the authority that you have. He's going to reveal unto you the ministry, the calling that you have. He's going to reveal unto you the assignment that you have. He's going to reveal unto you what keys you need for what purpose. Amen. Amen. So this is important for us to make some adjustments here. Up until this time, the church, the church in, in America was pretty much basically preaching about the rapture. And I'm not talking about the rapture today, but I'm going to point out later that the, peop, the leadership of this movement in 1948, they saw the move of God as a move of dominion. Not, not of, of escape, but an empowerment to invade, to occupy, to influence, and to take over. That's a different way of seeing yourself. Because the other way would be to see uh, uh, how bad things are and to, and to go through your Bible looking for a way to escape or a way to get out of here. And so we would call, in that case, the rapture teaching the great escape. And I, don't, and I'm, I, and I can tell you right now that the rapture teaching wasn't, wasn't to disarm people to make them apathetic and lukewarm. It wasn't at all. It was just to expect the return of the Lord. But remember, the enemy can take things and, and twist them around. But nevertheless, you and I have to understand that Jesus sent us the Holy Ghost. He, he, he valued the Holy Ghost, and we need to value the Holy Ghost as well. Amen? So we need to be filled with the Spirit of God. So when you're filled with the Holy Ghost, you're going to speak in other tongues, you're going to prophesy, you're going to start seeing yourself in a different manner than you did before, and you'll start seeing Jesus different than you did before. Now, Jesus is telling his disciples, this is what's going to happen when I send you the Holy Ghost. He's not going to speak of things on his own, but whatsoever he hears, he's going to speak. Now, verse 23, and in that day, you shall ask me nothing, 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, whosoever you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will what? He's going to give it to you. He's not going to hold back. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall what? Receive, that your joy might be made full. So now Jesus, this author, he's telling us, this is what's going to happen when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. He's telling them, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to send the Holy Ghost. He's not going to speak on his own accord, but whatsoever he hears from the commanding heights, that's what he's going to speak to you and reveal to you. And then he says this, I'm going to give you the master key. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of God. What is the key to the kingdom of God? The master key is the name of Jesus. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Look, devils tremble at the name of Jesus. You remember the story of uh, the seven sons of Sceva, right? They tried to cast out a devil and in the name of the, uh, of the Lord that Paul preached about, and nothing happened. But what happened was when somebody that had the anointing on them began to speak in the name of Jesus, guess what happened? The Holy Ghost came, and those demons had to jump up and leave. Amen? This is typical today in, in our type of churches. Our type of churches are supernatural churches. We believe in the power of God to heal. We believe in the power of God for deliverance. We believe in the power of God to change lives. We believe in the power of God to change the direction of our life. Amen. So Jesus authorizes the church to use his name. And when you use his name, you shall receive that your joy might be full. So these are the type of things that the, church, the early church in America began to preach. They began to preach dominion. They began to preach the supernatural power of God. And I'm going to read some of those things in a minute. But before I do, let's go back to it's Deuteronomy 11, I think it is. Let's go to Deuteronomy 11. And I want you to see where they're talking about the early reign and the latter reign. Now, remember this. You get what you preach. If you want a move of God, you got to preach a move of God. You know, years ago, my, I had a conversation with my mother. My mother said to me, my mother was a godly woman. My grandmother was a godly woman. And uh, my mother used to have these Bible studies over at her house. And so I'd go over there, and, and I used to do all kinds of things to bug my mother. She'd, like, sit in a room, watch TV with the lights off, and I'd walk in and turn the lights on and things like that. I'd just mess with her a little bit. But I remember one day she said, son, you need to be praying for revival. And I said, mom, I'm not praying for revival. She said, what do you mean you're not praying for revival? I said, I'm not praying for revival. I said, we're, we're gonna re what are we going to revive? We're going to revive a dead network that doesn't work, a model of ministry that doesn't work. I said, I'm not praying for re re revival. I'm going to carry revival. Hallelujah. Somebody say, I'm called to carry revival. The spirit of the Lord is upon us, amen, because he has what? He has anointed us. Well, if we're anointed, then we ought to what? Do what God says we can do. So if God gives us the name, we're going to use the name. If God gives us the anointing, we're going to walk in the anointing. If God gives us revelation, we're going to believe what he says. Amen. We are not living in the dark ages. We are living in the New Testament church of Acts. Amen. Where we have demonstration of the power of God Almighty in our life. This is what we believe for. This is what makes us different. This is what gets God's attention. Your difference gets God's attention. So I would rather hang out with you guys than sit in a dead, dumb church with a bunch of religious people, amen? I want to hang out with people that know God, pray, want to receive, want to walk in the anointing, want to watch devils tremble, amen? I mean, I, 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 want, to, I want to see God birth new songs. That I, I, want to, I want to hang around the anointing. I want to be with other people of faith, hallelujah. You know, I've got a spiritual family, amen? I have a natural family. But I'm going to tell you what, my spiritual family wants to serve God, and those are the ones I like to hang out with the most. I'm sorry. Are you in Deuteronomy chapter 11? Now look at this. It's a little bit long, but we've got to go through this because this is what they were teaching. They were teaching on Deuteronomy chapter 11 about the early rain and the latter rain. And because they were teaching on it, they started to experience it. Now, I don't know if you guys, how many of you were here when I used to wear a raincoat up here and I had an umbrella. Do you guys remember that? And I was preaching about the former rain and the latter rain and I had my, I had my, my, my raincoat on and then the ushers, all the porters had their rain gear on and we were talking about the, the, the latter rain and the early rain, amen. And we were believing God for it to rain. Rain with the power of God Almighty, amen. And some people couldn't understand why we're, we were wearing raincoats inside the church. Well, that's why, because we were believing God. 
Sometimes when you believe in God, you're going to pick up your keys and you're going to find a raincoat. Amen. So in Deuteronomy chapter 11, look what he says in verse 8. Therefore shall you keep all the commandments which I command you today, that you may be what? Strong and go in and possess it where, whether you go to possess it. See the word possess? The word possess is a militant term. It's got, it's got warrior written all over it, amen? It's got, it's got invade, occupy, influence, take over. It's got a militant type of fervor to it. It's, it's, mili- it's almost like it's a military term. So it's, so it's not something you're just going to sit around and wait for. You're going to go after it. Somebody say, I'm going to go after it. And you know, when you go after the anointing, God sees that and he says, all right, son, take it, amen? Because you'll always get what you pursue. So he says here, and you may... Pro, that you may prolong your days in the land. Well, what land is it? It's the promised land, which the Lord swore unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed a land that what? A land that flows with milk and honey. What is he talking about, milk and honey? I don't want a bucket of milk and a thing of honey. What he's talking about is prosperity. Remember when Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Somebody say, The acceptable year of the Lord is a year of debt forgiveness. It's when God says, all right, we're going to forgive debt. We're going to step in the way, and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to run debt out of here. I was amazed Friday night at how many of you guys have student loans, because the Holy Ghost was talking about, let's pray again, let's pray for God to cancel these student loans. How many people here have a student loan? Anybody here? Raise your hand high. Come on, hop, 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 hop. Come on, do you believe God that God could cancel that? Do you really, do you really believe it? I mean, I mean, all things are what? Possible to he that believeth. Amen. So you got the state telling you it's not possible, but God says, wait a minute, hold on for a minute. I'm the one that gave you the keys. I'm the one that gave you the anointing. I'm the one that put the call of God upon you. I'm the one that gave you the assignment. And I'm the one, guess what, that sent you the Holy Ghost, and I can break the power of debt. Hallelujah. we got to believe we receive it. Remember, you get what you preach about. If you... If you're preaching, we're in bondage, we're in bondage, we're oppressed, we're oppressed, we're in bondage, we're in bondage, we're oppressed. Then guess what you're going to be walking in? Oppression. Somebody say, I'm not walking in oppression. I am not oppressed. I got the Holy Ghost. All things are possible to him that believeth. God said to me, I can speak new things into existence because he's given me an unction, the unction of the Holy Ghost to speak his word. Hallelujah. Who is God to you? Is he a supernatural God? Then he can do supernatural things. Somebody say, go ahead on God. (laughs) Hallelujah. Now I forgot what is that. For the land where you go into what? Possess it. Somebody say, fight for it. Let's, let's Let's change the term a little bit, okay? For the land where you go to fight for it is not as the land of Egypt. It's not like Egypt from where you came out of. Uh uh-uh, uh, where you sowed thy seed and waters it with thy foot, as a, in other words, where you where you were employed before. But the land where you go to fight for it is a land of hills and valleys, and it drinks water of the rain of heaven. A land which, the, in other words, it responds to the anointing. It's a land that responds to the anointing. It's a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. Somebody say, God, finish your work. God, finish your work. He's the author and the what? The finisher. And it shall come to pass. Come on now. If you shall hearken diligently unto the commandments which I command you this day to love the Lord your God. And to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you what? The rain of your land in due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou might gather in thy corn and thy wine and thy oil. You know, going to Nicaragua, how many people have been to Nicaragua with me now? Nicaragua. Look at that. Wow. Do you know that there's a time of the year where there's no rain in Nicaragua and everything like turns brown? I mean, it is dry and hot as a bone. I mean, the mountains start to t- the, the 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 dirt starts to turn like an orange-looking color, like it's a fiery orange. I mean, it looks hot, it feels hot, it is hot. And uh, what I noticed one day, I was driving to Lyon, 
and it was right at the beginning of the early rain. And the early rain dropped. It didn't rain for maybe, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes. And then on the way back from Lyon, back to Masachapa, I saw that that area where it rained, man, it turned green just like that. And I was like, a little bit of water can change the foliage of a whole nation. If it can change the foliage of a whole nation, what can a little bit of water do for you? What can just a little bit of Holy Ghost fire do in your life? Somebody, somebody say, pour it out, God. Come on, God, pour it out. Pour it out. The early rain and the latter rain. Let it fall, fall, fall. Fall on me, God. Hallelujah. Woo. He said, I'm going to give you the rain of your land in its due season, the first rain and the latter rain. Now, I was in Nigeria. I'm going to talk about the latter rain for a minute. I was in Nigeria. went to God do well on my walkless church. And they took me from place to place to place to... Uh, and, and God too will tell the people, Apostle Jonas has an anointing for deliverance. If you have a demon, come up here and he'll play for you. And I'm like, nobody else introduces me like that in the whole wide world except for him. And I'm like, he keeps me busy working me, working me, working me, right? But walk to this. There was, a, I had to come back out of, out of Nigeria, right? And there was a strike for gasoline and things like that. People were lining up just for miles to get gas in the car. So anyway, I want to tell this story real quick. Anyway, um, I'm thinking we need to get some gas. They're thinking about something else. I'm thinking about getting out of here, about escaping from Nigeria. <laughs> After being there for a couple of weeks, just working me in the spirit. But anyway, we, we, we get in the car to go to uh, Lagos, where the airport is at. And, uh, but we need some gas. So God do well tells the driver to go around this line, this long line of people waiting in line for gas. He said, just go in front of them. And I'm thinking, now, you do that here in America, you're in for a fight. You know what I mean? You might as well be, you, might, you better have some weapons because the battle is going to be on. You're not going to jump a whole line with a mile long line of people waiting for gas. So we get in the front there, right? And, uh, you know, people are looking at me like, who's this dude, right? I'm, the, I'm, I'm trying to blend in, but it's not working real good, okay? So I'm trying to blend in, not happening. So anyway, I go inside. I said, what's going on here? Why aren't you pumping gas? And the lady, the owner of the station says, because it's raining. And it was, it, no, no, she said, yeah. She said, because it's raining. And I'm like, because it's raining, your pumps won't work when it rains? She said, oh, yeah, they work when it rains. And I said, well, then why don't you fill the cars up? She's like, I can't do it because it's raining. And I'm thinking, this is the idiotic thing I've ever heard. You know, it's awful when there's somebody that's an idiot in charge. You got people, you're about to riot outside and because it's, it's raining, but you won't pump the gas. So I told the lady, I said, all right. I said, look, I said, lady, I said, if we can stop the rain, will you pump the gas? She said, yeah, because you ain't, nobody's stopping the rain. I said, yeah, well, let's go see. So we went outside. I told the people at the pump that are looking at the white guy, you know, with, with vengeance in their whatever. And I told the people, I said, look, she says she won't pump the gas until it stops raining. That's what she said. I said, well, you guys believe with me that we can speak to the heavens and command the rain to stop? And they said, yeah, because they, well, you know, what else are they going to do? We all been standing in this line, right? So I said, okay, let's begin to pray. And we'd like huddled around the pumps and we began to pray. And guess what happened? The rain stopped. The rain stopped, and I looked at the lady. I said, see that? The rain stopped. You promised that, that you would pump gas if the rain stopped. She said, yes, yeah. so she pumps the gas in our car. And I said, I told God to do it. I said, let's get out of here in case the rain comes back. <laughs> I said, let's book it out of here quick, man. We got gas in the car, and everybody's happy, you know. But I saw, I saw God stop the rain to get a man of God back to the airport so he could come home to his church and <laughs> his family. Amen. This I will give you the rain of your land in due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou might gather in thy corn, thy wine, and thy oil. And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mightest eat and be full. By the way, whenever they mention cattle in the Bible, that, that's, a, that's a, 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 an expensive commodity. In other words, people would store their wealth in cattle. You understand that? So he's talking about wealth here. That's what he's talking about here. And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou might eat and be full. 
take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived, and do you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them? Well, what are these other gods? Well, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox News, oh, yeah. Channel 4, HBO, Max, uh, uh, what is it, um, Paramount, um, H HBO, all of this, all these foreign gods. Don't serve them. Don't be manipulated by them. Don't be trained by them. Don't be influenced by them. Don't serve other gods. You know, in Exodus chapter 20, five times, that's where you get the, the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20. Five times God says, I am the Lord thy God. I'm the one that delivered you out of the house of bondage. Don't serve any other gods. He says it five times. I am the Lord thy God that delivered you out of the house of bondage. I'm the one that delivered you out of the house of bondage. Don't serve these foreign gods. And all around us, folks, we have foreign gods. They're all around us. They're agendas. That God represents an agenda. You know, that there, you know that there's a demon power trying to stir up racism all the time to get us fighting each other instead of us seeing the real enemy? You know, your brother and your sister is not your enemy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. Yeah? So we have to understand that these false gods have an agenda. They want to advance their agenda. Amen. I can, feel the, I can feel the environment tighten up on that. I love it, man. Go ahead and tighten up. Tighten up all you want to. But we are not going to be a racist people. We're not going to be accused of being a racist people. Somebody say amen. Let me say it again. We are not a racist people, and we're not going to get accused of being a racist people. We are children of the Most High God. We're all children of God. Say amen, somebody. You know, we're going to fight back on this divisive stuff. These, the devil wants to use these wedge weapons always to divide us. It doesn't want us looking at the real enemy. Have you, ever, have you ever seen on TV, you know, they have these matadors and they're fighting the bulls and they've got the red cape and all that. Have you seen that? And then the bull, the bull goes and chases the red cape. But then you know what happens is the matador slips in a sword underneath that red cape, right? And so what happens is the bull doesn't see the sword inside the red cape. He just sees the distraction. I said he just sees the distraction. I said he just sees the distraction. But then the matador is waiting for the time, you know, to just to stab the, the bull. Somebody say, I'm not going to be distracted. In Jesus' name. You know, we are who God says we are. We can do what God says we can do. We have the anointing. The whole earth is waiting, groaning and travailing, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. Somebody shout, that's me. So he says here, and then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heavens that there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, at least you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord God giveth you. In other words, God won't be on your side anymore. Amen. 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 You know, when people are backslidden and they're praying, they can feel the heavens tighten up on them. Amen. And God's like, I'm not listening to this right now. You got to get right. That's right. Someone said, got to get right. Yeah. Verse 18, therefore... Shall you lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul and bind them for a sign upon your hand that they may be as the frontless between your eyes and you shall teach them your children, them, teach them to your children, speaking of them which thou sittest in the, thine house and where thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when you rise up. Whose responsibility is it to teach these children? So why are we letting the homosexual community be our teachers? Somebody say, no, we're not going to do that. You know, the state thinks, the state thinks that the children belong to them, that we are basically stewards of their children. Amen? That's what they think. Now, they might not say that, but that's what they think. They believe those children belong to them. And how dare you interfere with them? Mm-hmm. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gates, that your days might be multiplied, and the days of your children in the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers to give them as the days of the heaven upon the earth. For if you shall diligently keep all these commandments, which I command you to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to cleave unto him, then will the Lord drive out of these nations from before you, and you shall what? Possess greater nations and mightier ones than yourselves. And every place wherein the soles of your feet shall tread shall be what? They shall be yours from the wilderness of Lebanon 
from the river, the river Euphrates, even into the uttermost parts of the, of the coast, there shall no man be able to stand before you. For the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that you shall tread upon, as he has said unto you. Behold, I send before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which you shall have not known. Let me tell you something. God gave us a choice. Amen. Amen. Somebody say there's early rain and there's latter rain. And God has anointed us for such a touch time as this. The same anointing that was on Jesus is the same anointing that was on us. You've all heard of Jesus of Nazareth who God anointed with the Holy Ghost and with fire who went about doing good and healing all that were sick and oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Somebody say God is with me too. No weapon formed against me can prosper. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I can invade, occupy, influence, and take over, take dominion. Somebody say, take dominion. Take dominion. Say it again, take dominion. take dominion. That's going to be important in just a minute because I pulled off some of these things about what these guys were believing in back in 1948. And this is interesting because from 1948, we come over into the healing ministries, okay, where you had Oral Roberts and Jack Coe and A.A. Allen and even, even R.W. Schambach would be an extension of that, of that whole uh, movement that, that came uh, after 1948. But in 1948... Here's some of the things that happened. There was uh, some of the leadership. One, M.J. Billingsland, he was an American pastor and one of the founders of the Latter Rain Movement. He was born in Arkansas, pastored several churches in that state. He was a strong advocate of the Pentecostal and charismatic movements, and he was very influential. He wrote several books, one called The Latter Rain Movement, including The Power of the Latter Rain in 1949 and The Spirit-Filled Church in 1952. Then there was Ern Baxter who was an American pastor and one of the founders of the latter uh, Rain movement. He was born in Pennsylvania, and he pastored several churches in that state. He was a strong advocate of the Pentecostal movement. Uh, Baxter wrote several books about the latter Rain movement, including The New uh, Order of the latter Rain in 1956, The Manifestation of the Sons of God in 1958, and The Abundant Life in 1963. The main beliefs of the latter Rain movement, there's a few of there's uh, eight of them, and uh, the first one was they believed in the restoration of, of the five-fold ministry of apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to the church. Now, that might not sound like much today, but in 1948, it was a big, big deal because the only ministries that were recognized were the evangelists and the pastors and that the pastors could also teach. And so when you start talking about apostles and prophets, now all of a sudden you're stirring it up. And now the denominations are saying, wait a minute, the apostles all died off. So therefore, if the apostles all died off, then there can't be any today, which means that you're preaching a false gospel. Can you see that? So there was a battle to bring the five-fold ascension gifts, all of them, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers, into the, the mainstream of the body of Christ, which didn't happen, by the way because of the opposition against it. But yet, what God is involved in, the devil can't stop it. Amen. Amen. God will just deal with it. Amen. Amen. So uh, we see that today that, you know, God gave us five different ascension gifts, and most of us came out of pastoral-only ministries. And so we don't know much about the ministry of the apostle or the ministry of the uh, uh, prophet. But uh, also our perspective of, of any other type of ministry is basically the evangelist. And the evangelist would be somebody that, like, um, um, maybe somebody like, let's say, Dr. Billy Graham, for example. But yet, the church has to be involved. Let me tell you why. I was preaching in, I was preaching in, the, in the baseball stadium in, um, in um, Bluefields on the Atlantic coast of uh, Nicaragua. And uh, the first night, there was about 500 people got saved. When I went back to the hotel, I was so grieved, man, in my spirit about this. And I thought, why am I so grieved? I ought to be real happy 500 people get born again. You know, that's pretty good, right? You know, and uh, I'm thinking, man, God really moved really well. So the people responded to the salvation message. But then what happened was, where do they go to church? 
Where do you send these people? Do you send them now to a dead, dumb church, religious church with mean people? You know, religious people are mean. They'll stab you in the back. They'll talk about you. They'll gospel you. They'll ruin your, your character, your, and they just come against you. Amen. And so I, I felt terrible because what was happening was there was no good churches that I knew about at the time to send all these people. And it started grieving me that we didn't have the church structures, not just our church, but all the churches in the world. Where do you send all these people? You know, when Billy Graham, when Billy Graham came here years ago, I, you know where the, where the uh, Yankees, I mean, the, yeah, the Yankees that were practicing here and baseball here in Fort Lauderdale, I don't know the name of that thing. But anyway, Billy Graham's guys came to our church, and they said, Billy Graham has a burden on him to win the loss in our city. And so my pastor was saying we need to organize with the other pastors and we need to set it up where we get everybody, you know, to get their unsaved loved ones to come to, to the, um, the park, okay? So here's what happened. We did all that, you know, and it's part of the symbols of God and all of that. And we did all that and we had, I don't know, hundreds of pastors and churches over there. The stadium was packed. He does an altar call and people come down. They get saved, and then they fill out these little cards, and they give us the cards to follow up, right? Here's what happened. About two weeks after that whole thing was over with, I heard this lady say this. She said, I wish Billy Graham would come back in town because I, I got some more people that need to get saved. And so she said, let me say it again. She said, I, I, I can't wait till Billy Graham comes back in town so that we can get more people saved. And it hit me right there. She's waiting for somebody else to do what she's called to do. God gave us some apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the people, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. So to say that meant she had a wrong understanding of the fivefold ascension gifts. Amen. She thought that if you're going to get born again, you've got to go find this evangelist. But the work of the evangelist is to equip us to do the work of ministry. They do that by leading an example. Yeah? Can you see that? Yes. So, when this, so when this first thing that I'm talking to you about was, is written by them, what they preached, this would have caused tremendous opposition with some religious leaders in the body of Christ that didn't understand what God was trying to do. But even though he didn't do it in 1948, God spoke to me about it in 1999. Wow. Amen. And God's going to continue to speak to people about it. So the second one now, they believed in a new form of church organization that was led by apostles and prophets. How about that? Well, where's the, where's the pastors here? Here's what, they, here's what I think they were teaching. I think they were saying that the apostles and the prophets and the teachers are the governing gifts, but the pastoral is not a governing gift. That's a little tough for some people to understand. But when we're talking about, we're talking about the government of God. So I don't understand everything myself, but I can, but as a person that studies this stuff out, I would say that, they were talking about how we need to bring the apostles and the prophets together to be the leadership in the churches. Amen? All right, there's a whole lot more that goes with that. Number three, they believed in a return to the supernatural power of the early church. How many people believe that today? I remember I had lunch with a man one time. A, a, a pastor friend of mine invited me over for lunch. His brother was coming down from Canada. This guy had a religious spirit on him as big as the house. And I remember him saying something to his brother about that. You know, you're not Jesus. You're not Jesus. In other words, you're not Jesus, therefore you can't lay hands on anybody and see him get healed. You're not Jesus, so you can't ever have a prophetic word. You're not Jesus, so you'll never have a revelation. You're not Jesus. See what the religious spirits will do? So they were preaching that there's supernatural power in the church of God. That's what we preach today. Amen. But it wasn't, it wasn't always such an easy message to preach because, after all, you're not Jesus. And if God wanted to heal the world, he'd go out and heal the world, but he doesn't want to. Stuff like that, it happened. Yeah, it happened. There was big controversy over whether or not, they should, whether or not in Germany they should send evangelists to Africa. Because after all, why should we send them to Africa? If God wanted them saved, he would, he, would, he, would, uh, he would save them. Why should we bother sending missionaries to Africa? 
all of this warfare has been going on for a long, long time. Amen. The religious spirit is constantly trying to come against the power of God. Amen. All right. Number four, the belief that the latter outpouring of the Holy Spirit would bring about a supernatural spiritual revival. They believe that. Somebody say, thank you, God. Revive us again. Say it with me. Revive us again. Revive us again. Revive us again. In the back, of, I think it says, break up the fallow ground. Amen. Plow it up. Plow it up. Plow it up. Revive us again. Number five, the belief that the church should be a prophetic, supernatural, and end-time movement. Somebody say, it's all right when God uses prophetic words to bring us revelation and insight of our assignment. Number six, the belief that the church should be actively engaged in um, advancing the culture of the kingdom of God. How many people believe that? Number seven, the belief that the believers should, be in a, should live in a state of holiness and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Do you believe that? I believe that. And you know what? I can tell you this. When I, was, when I was growing up in the Church of God of Holiness, if you had earrings on, you were, you were a Jezebel. If you wore pants in the church, you were not saved. Amen. And I remember the legalism that was driving out the people from believing God for anything. The legalism is a nasty religious spirit. Amen. You know, racism and, and religion, religious spirits are cousins. They hang out with each other. And they're always nitpicking people all the time. Well, I remember Pastor Rana. I'm going to tell on Pastor Rana. We were going through some stuff, man. We were young. I don't know, 23 or 24 years old. My wife's down at the altar just seeking God and praying. And this lady came up behind her and said, Honey, if you'll quit smoking, God will be able to hear your prayers. That's called a religious spirit. Because God can heal you even if, while you're smoking. Now, smoke is not good for you, but it won't keep you out of heaven. It might get you there sooner. <laughs> and I hope that you're not smoking anyway. My testimony with smoking was I was smoking. I was smoking, hanging out with pastors. I was praying for the sick. Amen. Smoking. I've smoked for years. And then uh, one day I was sitting on my couch and the Lord spoke to me. And he said, I know you won't quit for you, but will you quit for me? And I'm like, God, that's not fair. That's not fair. You don't put me on the spot like that. I know you won't quit for you because, you know, I would read the scripture, your body's the temple of the Holy Ghost, and I yada, 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 I know all that already, and I'm still smoking cigarettes. It's called addiction. Anybody ever been addicted to anything? I was addicted to cigarettes. So I'm like, well, it's a big deal here, you know? And if, and if, and, um, so anyway, I'm sitting on the couch, and God speaks to me. He says, I know you won't quit for you. Will you quit for me? And the phone rings, and it's a pastor friend of mine. And I tell him about what happened when I'm, when I'm sitting, when I'm praying, sitting on the couch. And I'm telling him, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, I know you won't quit for you, will you quit for me? And he says, he says let me pray for you. Now, while he's praying for me, I'm smoking a cigarette. <laughs> Don't look at me like that. You probably do the same thing. And I'm not calling your house either. But... <laughs> He's praying for me, you know, that I, you know, I, I don't remember what his prayer was, but I'm smoking, you know, and he's praying, and I'm like, yes, yes, Lord. <laughs> Man, you know we're a mess. God has to clean up, amen. I said, yes, Lord. So anyway, I'm smoking, but you know what happened? I put that cigarette out, and I never had another one ever, ever again. You, ever, ever again. I never had any desire. I never had any pull, no addiction, no, no. I just quit, just like this cold turkey, just like that, bang. Pastor Ronnie got so mad at me because she used to smoke my cigarettes all the time. I, I used to think, man, I'm smoking a lot. I'd light up a cigarette and leave it on the, and she'd come by and pick it up on the way through the room. So really, I wasn't really smoking that much. It was probably her. But in, so anyway, I prayed for her, and God delivered her too. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, supernatural. Come on, man. We might need to pray for some addictions today. I saw some of your faces already, like, mm, hiding behind. Putting the, putting the Bible up, putting, putting the Bible on top of your head like that. Oh, no, he's going to see me. He's going to see me. Yeah, yeah. Hey, look, we're talking about miracles. You know what? Pastor Rana, when we were in Nicaragua, her, um, her, one of her fillings fell out. So we go to the dentist a couple of days ago, and the dentist says, well, I'm going to put a temporary filling in there, but you're going to have to have a root canal. How many people would like to have a root canal? How many people have had one? 
How many people are just glad you don't have to get any more? <laughs> so anyway, guess what happens? So she goes, they said they scheduled her for a root canal, right, right? for Friday, just, just Friday last. And right. Pastor Rhonda, she hates that, right? She's praying in the spirit all week. She's all like fighting her way through. She gets there. They go in and they, I forget, they started cleaning out the filling. They said, wait a minute. Let's x-ray this thing again. They x-rayed it again. They said, she doesn't need a, she doesn't need, she doesn't even need a root canal. Oh Let me tell you something. That'll make you jump up out of the doctor's chair. I mean, we were talking about miracle. That's a good miracle where you don't have to get a root canal. So said, That's a good one. Hey, Amen. So she's so excited. She didn't need a root canal. Just got a filling. That's all. 150 bucks and it's over with. Hallelujah, somebody. Glory to God. Number eight, the belief that miracles, signs, and wonders should be evident in the church. How many people believe that? Say, Lord, I believe in miracles. Hallelujah. The teaching of the latter rain movement had a significant impact on the Pentecostal and charismatic movements. The movement's emphasis on the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, the restoration of the fivefold ministry, and the prophetic, supernatural, and end-time nature of the church were all embraced by the larger movement. The movement also encouraged its followers to live holy lives and be actively involved in advancing the values of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Now here's the part that I want you guys to listen to really strong. This is Hawkins. This is one of the, I don't know who this man was, but here's what he said about the movement, okay? I do not wish to overemphasize the importance of this truth. But I am constrained to say that these truths are immense importance because they are foundational. Upon their firm footing rests the whole superstructure of God's plan for the ages. So he's really putting a lot of importance on this. If we cannot see how in the very beginning God created man for the specific purpose of ruling the universe and having dominion over all the vast subsurreal with its infinite space and multi-billion galaxies, then we have missed the heart of God's intention completely, and we become doomed to spend our lives in the idle pedophaging of the Roman and Protestant systems, which give neither reason for man's existence nor cause for his humiliation and fiery testings. Even redemption, full and complete, as it is, and in spite of its infinite cost, will fail to reconcile and save more than 1% of all creation in the fruitless interpretations of the Babylonian systems are to be believed. The teachings of the latter rain movement are still widespread today, especially within the charismatic renewal. What is he saying here? What he's saying is that if you don't understand how God designed you, to take dominion, then you have missed the mark. That's what he's saying. That's how important the whole movement was about, that if you don't see it. In other words, if you're just looking for a way out of here, you know, if you're just coming to church and make sure you're born again, that's not enough. He said you have to see how God designed you. God designed you as a man to invade, occupy, influence, to take over. He designed you that way. We are designed by God. That's why I talk to you about design all the time. God designed you. God designed the kingdom. God designed the kingdom to respond to the man of God. The kingdom of God is voice activated. God wants you to speak to the mountain and command it to move. Yeah. The Bible says that you can act like God. Amen. And Romans chapter 4 says that you can act like your father. You can call those things to be not as though they are. Somebody say amen. amen. So let me wrap it up with this. God has given us the word. And he's given us the spirit. He's given us his name. He said, you can use my name. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, Jesus Christ is Lord. He's given us the blood. What does the blood do? It speaks redemption for us and judgment for the enemy. He's given us the armor. What is armor for? Somebody say the armor is to fight. He's given us the sword. What's the sword for? It's for fighting, not for eating. Amen. He's given us the, the power of praise. What happens when you praise him? God inhabits what? The praises of his people. And he's given us the power of agreement. Somebody say, thank you, Lord, 
that every place that I put my foot today, I'm going to possess it because you've given it to me. I'm going to live a life of believing you for signs and wonders and miracles. Thank you, Lord, that you anointed me for such a time as this. I am part of this call. I am part of this assignment. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Now stand up on your feet. Stand up on your feet. Go ahead. You can clap. Go ahead. I'm going to give you the land in its due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou might gather in thy corn, thy wine, and thy oil. Years ago in Nicaragua, I'll tell you this real quick, in Nicaragua, I think it was 1999. In 1999, I, I remember uh, preaching about when David said, is there not a cause? And I remember in Nicaragua, man, the oppression was horrible on the people there at the time. I mean, it was tough in 1999. And um, I remember standing on top of a tractor trailer preaching in the city of Crucero on top of the mountain on the way to the TV station. <clears throat> and the Lord spoke to me, and he said, I want you to proclaim this amongst the nation. And it was like this. No longer will Nicaragua be a reproach amongst the nations, but I will give her corn and wine and oil. Amen. Amen. And other things that the Lord had spoken to me back then, I began to preach that. I started preaching that on the back of this tractor trailer. And then I started preaching it around the country. And I noticed that it started giving me hope to people again that God would pull them out of their sorrow and God would pull them out of their pain and their, and their poverty. And it began to change the nation. I mean, people began to hear it. And uh, so then I remember being in London and the Spirit of God spoke to me. He said, I want you to go back to America and I want you to start an apostolic movement. Amen. And I'm like, you know, who am I to do any of that, right? And I remember this. When I came back here, that was 1999, I came back here in this church, and we put a big banner on the wall over here that said, is there not a cause? Everybody here, you've got to understand something. You know, when God poured out his spirit upon David, God poured out his anointing upon him to rule as a king. And this is what God's saying to us. Is there not a cause? Is there not a reason that God has anointed us? Isn't there something God has called us to do? Are we not called to stand in the gap and make up the hedge? Are we not called to fight against the principalities and powers? Are we not called to advance the gospel of the kingdom? Are we not called in this assignment? And let me tell you something. We've got to lift up our heads. All you gates, be lifted up. All you everlasting doors, that the king of glory might come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Who is the king of glory? The Lord almighty. Here's what I think we ought to do today. If... You had some student loan situation. I want you to come down here. We're going to extend Friday night's prayer. If you're having a battle with, if you're having a battle with student loans, how many people can believe God for the impossible? The state says you're bound forever. You know, student loans was supposed to be a blessing, and now it's ended up being a curse, enslaving people. Anybody else got a student loan you'd like to get rid of? Now, just like I said Friday night, I'm not telling you to uh, not pay your bills now. What we're going to do is believe God to break this. Amen. Now, listen up. we got a scripture to stand on. Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. That's called the year of Jubilee. Do you understand? So we're going to believe something that's in the book. It's in the book. It's called the year of Jubilee. And it means this, that we can go to God. Remember, he said, you know, up to this point, you haven't asked anything in my name. But go ahead and ask, right? So we're going to ask God to help us get out of this debt. Amen. Now, how is he going to do it? I don't know. You don't know. I don't know. If you, if you knew, you'd have been out of debt already. So this is not about us trying to figure it out. This is about God handling it. So what are we going to do? Casting all of our cares on him. Because he cares for us. So we're going to ask God to do this. Somebody say, come on, God. Come on. We know you can do it. Stretch your hands this way. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the, for the word of the Lord that's come unto us today. Lord, in Jesus' name, these debts have become slavery. They have become bondage. What was sent out to be good has been turned around and become a curse, God. And in the name of Jesus, you have called us to be free. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. 
And in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost, we do come against this debt and command it to be canceled in Jesus' name. Somebody shall cancel in the name of Jesus. Somebody say, I call it done. I call those things to be not as though they are. And in Jesus' name, we believe we receive that answer right now. Thank you, Lord. We don't need to know how it's done. We just know we're here to receive the answer in Jesus' name. Now give God a big hand clap. <laughs> hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, God. Oh, God. Yeah, God. We see it done, God. We see the victory, God. We see the day canceled, God. Oh, Holy Ghost. Oh, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost. Thank you, God, for delivering your people. Thank you, God, for setting them free. Thank you, Lord, that you heard our prayers today. Thank you, Lord, God, you've come down to deliver us today. Thank you, Lord, God, we don't need to know how, but we look unto you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Thank you, Lord, God, you created us for such a time as this, and we are not going to be burdened down with debt. In the name of Jesus, we're a free people, and who the Son sets free is free indeed. Somebody say, freedom, freedom, freedom. Come unto me today. Freedom, freedom, freedom. Come unto me to stay. Freedom, freedom, freedom. Open my eyes and ears. Freedom, freedom, freedom. Oh, God. Let's play that song. Can we, can we do it? The one about praising God in the morning and the noontime. Can you play it on the bass there? We got one testimony? Mercy? Huh? Oh, wait. Okay, let me grab it. Is this mic on? Here, grab this mic. Good morning, everyone. About four weeks ago or so, I came to this Friday night, to this Friday night meeting, and I, there was an altar call from Prophetess Lisa, and um, I came to the altar, and she prayed for me. And she said, break through, break through. And I received it. I received that in my spirit. I received it. And I went, when we were leaving also in the parking lot outside, she said, break through, break through. And I said, yes, <laughs> yes. You know, because I am sure the spirit of God was speaking. And I believed it. And about a week after that, I got an email. I looked at the email, and it came from the Student Loan Bureau. And I looked at the email. It was nighttime. I, I, was, about, I was going to my bed. So I, said, I, re I read the email, and I didn't think much of it because they're always sending emails. And um, in the, I said, OK. In the morning, when I wake up, I look at it and call the people. When I looked at it in the morning, it says, congratulations. <laughs> your student loan, your loan has been forgiven. Breakthrough. And guess what? I had $130,000 in student loan. Wow. 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 It was a bachelor's degree, and, that, and it wasn't the full bachelor's degree because I had some um, 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 credits already from where I came from. But it was, for the bachelors, for the few years that I did, it was half of the time, two years. And that was, it, it sent up the, the um, credit. Um, and then I did a master's degree, and both of them was $130,000. Wow. And that wow. $130,000 is forgiven. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So... So a burden that was hanging over my shoulder, that was hanging over me. Wow. 130,000. Wow. How am I going to pay this? How? Until I die. Right, right. right. Yeah. It, it was strangling me. But God, God in his goodness, God. heard God. and God. delivered. And he can do the same. Believe it. Accept it. Believe it today that he can. And he will. He will. <laughs> 
but God. Got another one? Good morning, uh, church. Uh, I had a loan uh, some years ago, and as she said that, you know, the education department, they send you emails about this and that. So I attended uh, University of Phoenix years ago, and they sent me a thing like fill the inquiry or whatever. I was like, okay, I answered the questions, you know, truthfully and everything. And then I ended up getting another email. So uh, I was uh, with Fed Loan. And I went on Fed Loan. I'm like, okay, they showed the amount, almost like $30,000. And I looked again. I'm like, zero, zero. So they ended up transferring it to Ed Financial. So when they transferred to Ed Financial, I said, let me give them a call because I could. I tried to go on their uh, website and try to log on my information and everything. It was like, can't be found. I'm like, what's going on? So I called them, and the lady was like, well, we have some good news through the bar's defense. It's discharge zero. Wow. And then I'm like, huh? And I'm like, when is this? This was June that I called. This happened in April. Didn't even know nothing about it. So she was like, okay. She was talking about different amount. I'm like, okay. So she was like, Oh, wow. So they're not only did they discharge, they're also giving me a refund back. <laughs> so I owe zero. I had zero. <laughs> so if God did it for both of us, anything can be possible. Anything can be possible with the Lord. <laughs> Come on, let's pay the rock. I see zero. All zero. I see all zero. Hello, <laughs> somebody. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. How many grateful people do we have? Here? You know, didn't we just read a minute ago in the book? It says something about God is no respecter of persons. That means if he, ever, if he ever forgave somebody's debt, he'll forgive your debt, too. Somebody say, God is no respecter of persons. Somebody say, me, too. Say, I'm next. I'm in the line. Me, too. Come on, God. Go ahead on, God. Go ahead on. Let's sing this song before we go. Come on, put your hands together.
got young adults upstairs through the double doors and upstairs, young adults. Amen. How many people are excited about what God's doing? Somebody say, me too, God. You are no respecter of persons. What you've done for somebody else, you'll do for me too. Thank you, Lord. I believe I receive my answer today in Jesus' name. Now, by the way, I'm going to be standing ready to listen to some good reports to let us know whenever that. There's 130. I'm just counting the money. 130 and 30. Right? Is that what it was? 130 and 30? That's 160. So we got to get it up a little higher than that. Amen. <laughs> Give God another hand clap for that. And Lord, thank you for your blessing upon the people today. We call them blessed in Jesus' name. God bless you guys. You're dismissed.